As its technology changed, so too did Starfleet Command's entire starship aesthetic, leading to a variety of unusual vessel designs, including the Oberth class. But what do we know about this scientific starship wonder? Well, today we'll find out. Hello and welcome to another episode of Truth or Myth Beta Canon, a Star Trek web series that dives into the history of any given topic using Beta Canon sources and my own imagination to fill in the gaps. In today's episode, we're taking a look at the Oberth class as first seen in Star Trek III The Search for Spock to better understand its place in Star Trek history. Please note, one of the biggest problems for fans with this class since it debuted was the question of how people got from the primary to the secondary hull. Many theories were floated, debated, and argued about for many years, with a lot of fandoms still wondering what the answer to this question is. Well, good trinaries, Canon has already answered this one for us, thanks to a Mike Okuda display created for Star Trek The Next Generation. That's right, there are actually smaller turbolifts that go through each pylon. So, like it or not, that is simply how it is. And since Canon always trumps Beta Canon, this channel, and specifically this video, has embraced that fact wholeheartedly. And of course, as always, because this is a Beta Canon video, all information relayed should pretty much be taken with a grain of stardust and only considered a little bit of Star Trek fun. And so, with all that out of the way, let's begin. By 2265, it was becoming dilithium crystal clear to Starfleet Command that its current level of starship design was simply no longer cutting it. Between 2265 and 2270, almost 50% of the originally constructed Constitution-class starships had either been destroyed or very badly damaged. As a result of this, and coupled with Starfleet almost being defeated in a brief war against the Klingon Empire in the late 2250s, the powers that be had ordered brand new starship designs and poured all their resources into technologies that would benefit these new designs. The ultimate result of this effort would be a brand new state-of-the-art refit Constitution class, which would once again propel that class to the forefront of Starfleet's starship classes. A brand new, far more powerful warp core, along with many new improved offensive and defensive starship systems, would justify the resources placed into this refit project. But Starfleet Command wanted more. They wanted other starship designs based on this new technology. During the technological testing phase of the project, the USS Miranda had been commissioned as the test bed for all upgraded tech, and had performed admirably. So, as a result, Starfleet would commission a new class known as the Miranda class as its second class to carry this new technology. Considered a light cruiser, the Miranda class would become somewhat of a workhorse for Starfleet, becoming a jack-of-all-trades, so to speak, when it came to its mission profile. And although versatile classes, both the Miranda and Constitution classes had one downside. Neither was a dedicated science vessel class, which could utilize Starfleet's extensive breakthroughs in scientific technology. So, heading back to Starfleet's core of Starship design engineers, Starfleet requested a purely science-dedicated class to fill that gap. And thus, the Oberth class was born. Sitting at a length of approximately 120 meters and 13 decks tall, the Oberth class was designed to be operated by 80 officers and crew members. Capable of a standard safe cruising speed of warp factor 5 and an emergency maximum speed of warp factor 6, the Oberth class wasn't exactly the fastest starship class in the fleet, though given its designated mission profile, speed was not necessary. Initially equipped with only one forward-facing phaser bank, some later designs would see the inclusion of both a port and starboard phaser emitter, as well as a single photon torpedo launcher. The Oberth class's interior bulkheads were also designed with a Victrium alloy to better facilitate its shielding, 
and allow this class of starship to withstand all types of gravitational wave fronts. The Oberth class was a complete departure from Starfleet's standard starship designs. Although containing both a primary and secondary hull, this class would not connect the two in the traditional sense with the neck, rather using its nacelle struts to join the starship. This change in design was done on purpose. You see, the secondary hull was to act as the primary scientific section of the starship, while the primary hull held all the living quarters and support facilities. Because of its scientific mission profile, Starfleet wanted a starship that could easily jettison its secondary hull should a scientific study or experiment they were conducting get out of control and present a real danger to the starship's crew. And so, essentially, the Oberth class's secondary hull would act as a quarantine zone, crewed at any given time by only those required for any scientific study. The secondary hull would also sport Starfleet's brand new, very large sensor array system, based on technology developed for outposts along the Klingon and Romulan neutral zone borders. And due to its size and processing power, the new sensor systems were able to conduct planetary surveys in immense detail while simultaneously being able to do it in a fraction of the time it took other Starship classes to complete them. Keeping in line with the idea of a quarantine section of the Starship, access to the secondary hull would be achieved via two turbolifts which ran through the pylons of the ship. These turbolifts were not standard by any stretch of the imagination, being far smaller than those normally aboard a Starship. The warp nacelles of this class were connected directly to the primary hull. Power transfer conduits did connect the two sections of the starship together through these pylons. Main engineering itself was actually in the primary hull. This meant that if a catastrophe occurred that required the starship to jettison its secondary hull, the primary hull itself was still capable of warp and standard starship functions. A much smaller engineering with its own reactor did in fact exist in the secondary hull. Should an emergency separation be required, this meant that the secondary hull could continue operations allowing its crew a chance to re-establish control over whatever experiment had gone awry. And if control could be re-established, then the primary hull could tractor that section back to a starbase to be reconnected. Later in life, different versions of the Oberth class's design would be constructed. This included a personnel transport design and a cargo carrier design. By the 24th century, an emergency hatch was included on the bridge, which allowed for access to space in case of an emergency. The Oberth class was a huge success overall, lasting far longer as a class than its designers had ever intended. Unfortunately, the Oberth class would in fact receive a reputation as a death trap of sorts by a large chunk of the population within the Federation. Due to the nature of its mission profile, the Oberth class would see more losses than what was standard for Starship classes of the time, leading many officers in Starfleet to look down upon the class. But the truth was, the Oberth class was just as good as any other Starfleet vessel class within its mission profile, causing Starfleet to consider the class one of the best successes of its time. And because of its success, Starfleet would continue to use and construct this design until the late 2360s, when the breakthroughs in technology as a direct result of the Battle of Wolf 359 would see the Nova class develop to replace the aging Oberth design. Although the Oberth class would receive a reputation for being easily destroyed, both Starfleet Command and Federation historians cannot deny the impact this class had on exploration and discovery within the Alpha and Beta quadrants, earning this class its truly deserved place in Starfleet history. Thank you for watching today's episode of Truth or Myth Beta Canon. What do you think of the Oberth class and the historical narrative that I've created here? Do you want to see more videos like this one? Well, leave your comments in the section below. 
And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Want to help the channel conduct a long and boring planetary survey while simultaneously ensuring it survives the day? Then consider becoming a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching, live long, and prosper.